Welcome once again to this YouTube channel. Kindly subscribe to this channel. The topic is pelvic cavity, peritoneum, and peritoneal cavity of the pelvis. Now, what is the pelvic? What do we need to know about the pelvic cavity? The abdominal pelvic cavity extends superiorly into the thoracic cage. It also extends inferiorly into the pelvis. So you find out that its superior and inferior parts are relatively protected. Uh, abdominal pelvic cavity, I say abdominal pelvic cavity because it's continuous. The abdomen is continuous with the pelvis. There is really no demarcation. So when you have perforating wounds in either the thorax or the pelvis, you could uh, have um, the abdominal pelvic cavity and the viscera affected. It could be injured. Right here is an illustration of the sagittal view of the pelvic cavity. When you take a look at this diagram, you be, or that is uh, actually that of a female, you'll be able to appreciate the funnel-shaped pelvic cavity. And uh, you can see there is a space bounded peripherally by the bony uh, ligamentous and muscular. You have bones, you have ligaments, and you also have muscles that are of the pelvic walls and floor. The pelvic cavity is actually inferior and posterior to the abdomen. It's continuous with the abdominal cavity and the pelvic inlet but it's angulated posteriorly from it. So the pelvic cavity contains the terminal parts of the ureters and the urinary bladder. You have the rectum, you also have genital organs like the uterus and ovaries. Then the, you also have um, some abdominal viscera like the small intestine, mainly the ileum. At times you have the large intestine, the appendix, and, uh, as well as the transverse and or sigmoid colon. The pelvic cavity is limited inferiorly by the pelvic diaphragm, which is a musculofacial structure. And the pelvic diaphragm is suspended above and it descends centrally. So the central part is, is uh, quite uh, is at a lower level. Uh, it goes down to the level of the pelvic outlet. And if you now have a bowl-shaped pelvic floor, the pelvic cavity bounded posteriorly by the coccyx and the inferior part of the sacrum. Then you find out that the superior part of the sacrum forms a roof over the posterior part of the half of the pelvic cavity. Then the bodies of the pubic bones and the pubic symphysis that uh, unite the bodies of the pubic bones forms an anterior inferior wall, which is shallower, that's shorter than the posterior superior wall, which is more extensive. So the posterior inferior superior wall uh, extends to form a ceiling, and the posterior superior wall or, and ceiling is formed by the sacrum and coccyx. So the pelvic, the orientation of the pelvis is such that it is a, uh, you watch the a previous video I did on, that mention, I mentioned the orientation of the pelvis. So the pelvis is actually tilted, such that the, what ought to be the anterior aspect is like a, a floor, that's the pubic bones. The axis of the pelvis, that's a line that goes through the median plane, that goes through the center point of the pelvic cavity at every level, is actually called because of the orientation of the pelvis, and uh, it forms a pivot around the pubic symphysis. The COVID form of the axis, as well as the disparity in depth between the anterior and the posterior walls of the pelvic cavity, are very important and they are significant as far as the mechanism of fetal passage through the pelvic canal at childbirth is concerned. So we like it that way because it helps the fetus, the child to come out um, joyfully during delivery. Now, I need to talk about the walls and floor of the pelvic cavity. The pelvic cavity has an anterior inferior wall 
it has two lateral walls, it has a posterior wall, which is actually a posterior lateral wall and a roof, and uh, it has a floor. Right here is an illustration of the pelvic walls. It's actually a section, a sagittal section through the, the pelvis. The, you see this um, section showing the pelvic walls. Deep to it, you have uh, the muscles. Then deep to the muscles, you have the pelvic nerves. And then of course you have Deep to that, you have the pelvic fascia. The endopelvic fascia, we're going to talk about it. You will see it in a, some other video on this channel. Then you also have, quite deep, you have the blood vessels, the veins and the arteries. Here, we're going to talk about the peritoneum. Peritoneum, so it's illustrated here. You see the visceral peritoneum surrounding the organs, the viscera, and of course the pareta peritoneum. So the arrangement of structures in the walls of the pelvis is a, a section is illustrated in that diagram. Now I'm still talking about the walls and floor of the pelvic cavity. I want to talk about the anterior inferior pelvic wall. The anterior inferior pelvic wall actually is more of a weight-bearing floor because of the orientation of the pelvis, the way the pelvis is tilted. So you see that the anterior inferior pelvic wall is more of a weight-bearing floor than an anterior wall per se in the anatomical position. And it's formed by the bodies and rami of the pubic bones and pubic symphysis. The anterior inferior pelvic wall participates in bearing the weight of the urinary bladder. What about the lateral pelvic walls? The lateral pelvic walls are formed by the right and left hip bones. Each of these hip bones include an obturator foramen. So each hip bone includes an obturator foramen which is closed by an obturator membrane. So we're still looking at the lateral pelvic walls. You have the fleshy attachments of the obturator internal muscle. Uh, it covers and parts most of the lateral pelvic walls. Then the fleshy fibers of this obturator internal muscle on the right and on the left, they converge posteriorly, become tendinous, Turn sharply laterally, pass from the lesser pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen and attach to the greater trochanter of the femur. The medial surfaces of the obturator internal muscles are covered by obturator fascia, which are thickened centrally as a tendinous arc that provides attachment for the pelvic diaphragm. The pelvic diaphragm, we'll talk about, I will talk about it shortly. The pelvic diaphragm is the boundary between the pelvis and the perineum. So it forms the floor of the pelvic cavity and it forms the roof of the perineum. So you find out that this attachment of the, the obturator fascia that I said thickens to form the tendinous arc is uh, very significant and uh, the pelvic diaphragm divides the obturator internal muscle into a superior pelvic portion and an inferior perineal portion. Medial to the pelvic portions of the obturator internal muscles, you have the obturator nerves and vessels, and you also have branches of the internal iliac vessels. So the section is what we saw earlier on. Right now, let me talk about the posterior wall of the pelvis. The posterior wall is actually a posterior lateral wall and roof. In the anatomic position, you find that the posterior pelvic wall consists of a bony wall and roof in the midline. And this is formed by the sacrum and coccyx. You also have musculoligamentous posterior lateral walls. And these are formed by 
the ligament associated with the sacroiliac joints and the piriformis muscles. The ligament include the anterior, anterior sacroiliac ligament, the sacrospinous ligament, and sacrotuberous ligament. The piriformis muscles arise from the superior part of the sacrum, lateral to the pelvic foramina. The muscles pass laterally, leaving the lesser pelvis, go through the greater sciatic foramen to attach to the superior border of the greater trochanter of the femur. The piriformis muscles occupy much of the greater sciatic foramen and, and form the posterolateral walls of the pelvic cavity. Immediately deep, that is anterior medial to the piriformis muscles, you find the nerves of the sacral plexus and these nerves are embedded in the fleshy fibers of the piriformis muscle. So when there is piriformis syndrome, it could affect these nerves and you have a pain around the distribution of these uh, nerves. A gap at the inferior border of the piriformis muscle allows passage of neurovascular structures between the pelvis and the lower limb. Next, the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is formed by the bowl or funnel shaped pelvic diaphragm, which consists of the coccygeus muscle and levato ani muscles, and as well as fascias cover the superior and inferior aspect of these muscles. The pelvic diaphragm separates the pelvic cavity from the perineum within the lesser pelvis. I have said that before. Right here is an illustration of the pelvic floor. If you take a very close look at that diagram, you are going to see the, the various muscles that make up the pelvic floor there have various colors on that diagram. You, the coccygeus muscles are there. The coccygeus Muscles have a pink color in that diagram. That's the right and left procedures muscles. Look closely at the diagram. You see that they arise from the lateral aspects of the inferior part of the sacrum and the coccyx. The fleshy fibers of the procedures muscles underlie the deep surface of the sacrospinous ligament. Then the levator A9 muscle is a broad sheet. It's a broad sheet. You can also see the muscles that make up the levator A9 there. That broad sheet. It's a larger and more important component of the pelvic floor. The levator A9 is attached to the bodies of the pubic bones anteriorly, to the ischial tuberous spines posteriorly, and to a thickening in the obturator fascia. That the, the thickening in the obturator fascia that um, the levato ani is attached to is actually the tendinous arc of the levato ani. And you find that between the two bony sites on each side. So between the attachment on the right and left, you have the tendinous arc of the levato ani. So the pelvic diaphragm, which is made up of the levator ani and the coccygeus muscles, um, actually stretches between the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior walls of the lesser pelvis. And it gives it this kind of appearance of a hammock suspended from uh, at its atta the attachments. And it closes much of the ring of the pelvic girdle. You have an anterior gap between the medial borders of the levator ani muscles of each side. So this anterior gap is what we call the urogenital hiatus. It gives passage to the urethra. In addition, in females, it gives passage to the vagina. The levator ani cons consists of three parts. And uh, these three parts are named according to the attachments and course of the fibers. You have the puborectalis, which is thicker, it's narrower, and it's the medial part of the levato ani, consisting of muscle fibers that are continuous between the posterior part of the right and left pubic bone. 
bodies. The pupil rectalis forms a U-shaped muscular sling, what we call the pupil rectal sling, that passes posterior to the anorectal junction. And uh, in the process, it, it, it bounds the urogenital hiatus. This is very important in maintaining fecal continence. You um, find out that the levator ni is um, contract and relax in concert with the pubo rectalis and the external anal sphincter, and this helps in maintaining a, a fecal continence. The pubo rectalis muscle forms, a, we have said, it forms a U-shaped sling at the around the anorectal junction, and uh, it maintains an angle like approximately 90 degrees between the rectum and the anal canal. So fecal counting uh, count is actually maintained by a complex sphincter action that it involves the, not only the levator anal, you also have the, the external anal sphincter, which is, has righted muscle, and uh, you also, you, uh, that's where the football rectalis actually passes around and then uh, you have the internal inner sphincter as well so the pubo rectalis muscle forms a loop around the posterior aspect of the external sphincter and when it contracts it somehow creates this you know rectal angle and it helps in uh, preventing defecation so during rectal feeling defecation is prevented you have fecal continence then um, I'm still talking about the levator ani consisting of three parts. The pubo rectalis, I've talked about that. Then the levator ani also consists of pubo cosigios, which is wider but thinner and it's the intermediate part of the levator ani. It arises laterally, lateral to the pubo rectalis. It forms the posterior aspect of the body of the pubis and uh, the anterior tendinous arc. It passes posteriorly in almost a, a nearly horizontal plane. Its lateral fibers attach to the coccyx. Its medial fibers merge with that of the contralateral muscle to form a fibrous raphe or tendinous split. It also um, forms a part of the anocosidial body or ligament between the anus and the coccyx, which is called clinically the levator plate. So still talking about the levato and I have mentioned the pubo rectalis and pubo cosigios. You also have the ilo cosigios, which is the posterior lateral part of the levato ani. It arises from the posterior tendinous arc and the ischial spine. It is thin and often, often poorly developed. When you have it, it's uh, aponeurotic and it blends with the endocosigial cosigial body posterior. So the levator ana is very important. It forms a dynamic floor and it supports the abdominal pelvic viscera, the organs. It, most times it's in a tonically contracted state and it's in that state it supports the, the organs you have in the abdominal pelvic cavity. It also helps in maintaining both urinary and fecal continence. Like I was trying to um, explain, so it helps in maintain. You find out that it's Actively contracted during activities like when you are carrying out activities like coughing, sneezing, vomiting, and all that is actively contracted, and then you it now helps to fix the uh, trunk during strong movements of the upper limb, like when you're lifting an object, because in this time you have a, a, the you need to it needs to increase the support of the viscera during. Uh, times like that when there's increased intra-abdominal pressure so it tends to resist the forces that tends to push the uh, abdominal pelvic viscera down to the pelvic artery so it repair it tries to resist the forces by being tonically contracted remaining in that state and then it also uh, helps to um, maintain the support the structures in that state so you remember that the levato ana is centrally is penetrated by the anal canal. So the levato ana is funnel shaped, 
and, and with the U-shaped pubo retalis looping around the, the funnel part, uh, spot and it's tonically contracted anteriorly so when there's active contraction of the pubo retalis it really helps in uh, maintaining uh, fecal continence during uh, rectal filling so even as I'm here now my rectum is filling up but I, I, I can say I'm not uh, defecating because of uh, the fecal continence and it's uh, maintained one of the, the mechanisms involves the levetal ani. Actually, levetal ani, in addition to the external anal sphincter, is working closely with it by being tonically contracted and maintaining the keeping that sphincter closed. And the other mechanism also, the mechanism also involves the, the smooth muscle internal anal sphincter as well. So when as the my rectum is filling up now. It's my levator ana is tonically contracted. But when my rectum is full, what happens? The involuntary sphincter is uh, inhibited, it's relaxed. The levator ana needs to relax to allow urination and defecation to occur. So if my rectum is filled up, my bladder is filled up, so the levator ana that is tonically contracted needs to do what? Relax. For me to urinate and then defecate. So you have in increased intra-abdominal pressure for defecation and this is produced by, as I want to defecate, this pressure comes from contraction of the diaphragm and muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall. So acting together, the levator ani tends to elevate the pelvic floor after their relaxation and then uh, uh, the, during defecation, what happens? As I want to defecate, the levator ani has to relax. As it's relaxing, the pelvic floor is going to go, it will be depressed, go to a lower level, and then the external inner sphincter is going to be relaxed as well, so that defecation can occur. Then after, Defecation, levato ani has to goes to the tonically contracted to the contracted state, and then the uh, pelvic floor is uh, elevated. So that's just the way it works. Same thing with uh, urination. So the urogenital hiatus is we, we remember is the space between the levato ani musculature where you have uh, the urethra going through the vagina and the rectum. So the, both the levator ani muscles and the pelvic fascia and the muscular structures of the urethra, uh, of the urethra, they work as a system and they help to try to maintain uh, urinary continence to prevent urine loss during stress, like when you cough it. So if this mechanism is not in place, you might have urinary stress incontinence. That's when somebody is coughing and then urine. Uh, passes out like that in the process. So don't forget that the pubo rectalis muscle, uh, the levator ana is very important in maintaining both urinary and fecal continence. So in the tonically contracted state, you find out that the external anal sphincter is contracted and during rect the rectum is filling up. So at the point when the rectum is full and I want to defecate, the levator ani has to relax. The external inner sphincter also be relaxed, open, then I can defecate with increased abdominal pressure that I that builds up. I'm able to pass out the feces. So the same way it maintains the urinary continence also in the tonically contracted state, the urethra sphincter is closed. So when it relaxes during urination, when bladder is full and you, you need to urinate, it relaxes, the levator ani relaxes and what happens? The uh, urethral sphincter also relaxes likewise and then one can pass urine 
Now I need to talk about injury to the pelvic floor. Injury to the pelvic floor. In the course of childbirth, the pelvic floor, which supports the fetal head while the cervix of the uterus is dilating, is very important because it needs to support for the cervix of the uterus to dilate and permit delivery of the fetus. The perineum, the levato ani, and the pelvic fascia, fascia may be injured during childbirth. The pubic procedures, which is the main and most medial part of the levato ani, is torn in most, in most times. And uh, when, when it's torn, this part of the muscle is important because it actually encycles and supports the urethra, vagina, and the anal canal. So what happens? Weakening of the levato ani and pelvic fascia resulting from stretching or tearing during childbirth may actually alter the position of the neck of the bladder and the urethra. So what happens? These changes may result in urinary stress incontinence. That's what I was trying to explain a, a while ago. So you have dribbling of urine when intra-abdominal pressure is raised like in coughing and lifting. Your urine now comes out because why? The, pelvic floor is weak, levato ani is weak, more particularly you have the pubo procedures muscle injured and then the position, the position of the neck of the bladder and the urethra are going to be affected because the pelvic floor was actually supporting all that, all the structures. So when they are affected like that you have a dribbling of urine when intra-abdominal pressure is what? raised like in coughing and lifting so you have a urinary stress incontinence that is when you have you uh, stress increased abdominal pressure as in coughing that's when the urine dribbles out comes out next let me talk about prenatal relaxation training for participatory childbirth at times the parent wants to participate actively in the birth of the baby and uh, such parent may need to take prenatal training so the lady or the female learns how to relax voluntarily the muscles of the pelvic floor while at the same time increasing intra-abdominal pressure and it do she does this by contracting the diaphragm and anterolateral abdominal wall muscles so she goes through some kind of training so what do you hope to achieve by this? It helps to facilitate the passage of the fetus through the birth canal. That's by actively pushing. When you tell the woman push, she's bearing down to aid the uterine contractions to expel the baby. So uh, in that case, with this practice, it's easy for the woman on the day of delivery. So the, the, this, uh, when you say push, there's, you have to. You, the woman is trying to uh, bring about contraction of the pelvic muscles so that childbirth can be easy so the woman is trained to do this before the day of delivery so except when defecating or urinating there is a natural reflex to contract pelvic musculature in response to increased intra-abdominal pressure now i need to talk about peritoneum and peritoneal cavity of the pelvis peritoneum and peritoneal cavity of the pelvis you have the parietal peritoneum lining the abdominal cavity. So the uh, peritoneum is like a lining of the abdominal cavity, just the way you have it lining the, ab um, the um, thorax. You also have it lining the abdomen and the pelvis. So the parietal peritoneum lines the abdominal cavity, continues inferior into the pelvic cavity, but it doesn't get to the pelvic floor. So it's separated from the pelvic viscera onto which it is reflected and the pelvic fascia in which the viscera are embedded so the pelvic organs are embedded in the pelvic fascia that's the connective tissue network that supports the pelvic viscera then you have a lining the lining the peritoneum is the lining of the line, connective tissue lining that you have in the abdominal uh, abdominal pelvic cavity the parietal peritoneum is the one close to the body wall. The one very close to the body wall is the parietal peritoneum. 
You also have the viscera peritoneum, the lining that is close to the viscera. But what are we saying here now? The lining of the abdomen, which continues as the lining of the pelvis, actually does not get to the word pelvic floor. So at a point, it now gets reflected onto some pelvic viscera. It covers certain aspects, surfaces of the pelvic viscera, not all the surfaces. So it's separated by the, it, it, it reflected onto the pelvic viscera. It doesn't get to the pelvic floor before it starts uh, being reflected onto the pelvic viscera. Then you have right here an illustration of the sagittal section showing peritoneum of the pelvis. When you take a close look, you're going to see the, this is a sagittal section. It's colored, the peritoneum here is colored green. You will see the peritoneal, peritoneal lining from the abdomen. It goes to the pelvis, but it does not get to the pelvic floor. It's now reflected. Take a close, close look at the diagram. It's reflected onto the uterus and the, the bladder. From the anterior abdominal wall, it's reflected onto the bladder, then onto the uterus, and then it goes on, re reflected onto the part of the rectum. So it doesn't get to the pelvic floor. Except for the ovaries and uterine tubes, the pelvic viscera are not completely ensheated by the peritoneum. Let's not forget that. So most of the pelvic viscera are not ensheated, covered by the peritoneum. Except it's only the, only the ovaries and uterine tubes that are completely ensheated, covered by the peritoneum. So most of the pelvic viscera actually lie inferior to the peritoneum um, and um, only their post superior and superior lateral surfaces are covered. A look at that diagram is going to help us appreciate this. Only the uterine tubes um, are intraperitoneal. The uterine tubes are covered by peritoneum except for their ostia which are open but the rest of the uterine tubes are covered by peritoneum and the, the uterine tubes are suspended by a mesentery that's a, a connective a, a tissue that comes from the peritoneum you have a mesentery connective tissue that suspends the uterine tubes the ovaries although they are suspended in the peritoneal cavity by a mesentery they are not covered with the with glistening, shining peritoneum. So what you have, you have a kind of dull epithelium made up of cuboidal cells covering the ovaries. Then you have a loose areolar layer between the transversalis fascia you have in the abdomen and the parietal peritoneum of the inferior, most part, the inferior part of the anterior abdominal wall. So you have the loose areolar layer and this loose areolar layer you find in between the transversalis fascia and the parietal peritoneum of the inferior part of the anterior abdominal wall. This loose areolar layer allows the bladder to expand between these layers, that's between the transversalis fascia and the peritoneal, parietal peritoneum. So the bladder expands as it's filling up and then it becomes distended with urine. The region superior to the bladder is the only site where parietal peritoneum is not firmly bound, bound to the underlying structures. So what do you have as a result? The level at which the peritoneum reflects onto the superior surface of the bladder is such that it creates what we call the supravesical fossa. So the peritoneum coming from the anterior, lining the anterior abdominal wall, gets, continues into the pelvis, the parietal peritoneum, to line the pelvic wall as well. And, but it doesn't get to the floor of the pelvis. It gets reflected onto the superior surface of the bladder. And as the process of getting reflected onto the superior surface of the bladder, what you have? A supravasical fossa is created. And this level is, is variable. The level at which this supravasical fossa occurs is variable, depending on the fullness of the bladder. So as the bladder is getting full, the bladder expands and the supravasical uh, 
four sides displaced superiorly. So the level depends on how full the bladder is. The fuller the bladder, the more superior the supravesical fossa. Now the peritoneum reflects from the abdominopelvic wall onto the pelvic viscera and fascia. You now have a series of folds and fossae formed as a result. In the female, as uh, the peritoneum is uh, gets uh, is, re is reflected at or near the midline, it reaches the posterior border of the roof of the bladder. It reflects onto the anterior aspect of the uterus and the uterine neck or isthmus. And uh, thus, you find out that the peritoneum is not related to the anterior vaginal furnace. It's in the female, it's reflected onto the superior surface of the bladder. It gets to the posterior surface of the roof of the bladder. It's now reflected on the anterior aspect of the uterus. It gets to the uterus, uter uterine neck or isthmus and it's reflected. So it does not get to the anterior vaginal furnace. So the peritoneum is not related to the anterior vaginal furnace. The anterior vaginal furnace is therefore subperitoneal in location. So any structure that is not covered by peritoneum is below it, below the peritoneum. We say it's what subperitoneal. The peritoneum in the female passes over the fundus of the and descends the entire posterior aspect of the uterus. It now goes onto the posterior vaginal wall before it now gets reflected superiorly onto the anterior wall of the inferior part of the rectum, which is expanded, we call the rectum ampulla. So you have a pocket formed between this reflection of the peritoneum from the uterus to the rectum, now forms a pocket. And this pocket is formed between the uterus and the rectum. We call this pocket the rectouterine pouch, or the, called the sac of Douglas. You have a medium rectouterine pouch, which is often described as the most inferior extent of the peritoneal cavity in the female. But when you go towards its last, lateral aspect, it has lateral extensions on each side of the rectum, which we call the what? Pararectal fossae. And these ones are actually deeper. So the pararectal fossae are actually deeper. In the recent of it, they are the deepest parts. So not the median rectouterine pouch. You have prominent peritoneal ridges, the rectouterine folds, which are formed by underlying fascial ligaments, which demarcate the lateral boundaries of the pararectal fossae. So the pararectal fossae, the right and left, are demarcated laterally by the prominent peritoneal ridges, which we call the rectouterine folds. And these ridges are formed by what the underlying fascial ligaments. The peritoneum passes up and over the uterus in the middle of the uterine cavity. You have a double peritoneal fold. So a double peritoneal fold is formed as the peritoneum is going up and over the uterus in the midline of the uterine of the pelvic cavity. A double peritoneum is a fold is, is formed on each side. And we call this the broad ligament of the uterus. This extends between the uterus and the lateral pelvic wall on each side. It actually forms a partition that separates the paravesical fossae and the pararectal fossae on each side. So you have paravesical fossae anterior, pararectal fossae posterior, and they are separated by what? The broad ligament of the uterus. The uterine tubes, the ovaries, Ligaments of the ovaries and the round ligaments of the uterus are all enclosed within the broad ligaments. Don't forget that in the female, the pelvic peritoneal cavity co communicates with the external environment via the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. In the males and in women who have had their uterus removed, that's women who have undergone hysterectomy, the central peritoneum descends a short distance as much as 2 cm down the posterior surface, that's the base of the bladder. 
and then it now reflects superiorly onto the anterior surface of the inferior part of the rectum, forming the rectal bicycle pouch, often described as the inferior most extent of the peritoneal cavity in male and then women lacking the uterus. Here also, you have lateral continuities of the rectal bicycle pouch on each side of the rectum, the so-called pararectal fossae, and these ones are often deeper than the median portion. The female rectal uterine pouch is normally deeper, it extends further caudally than the male rectal bicycle pouch. In the male, you have a gentle peritoneal fold or ridge, what we call the ureteric fold. And this is formed as the peritoneum passes up and over the ureter and ductus deferens, that's the vas deferens, which is the secretory duct of the testis, on each side of the posterior part of the bladder. And this separates the paravasical and pararectal fossae. So the paravasical fossae and the pararectal fossae are separated by what? The ureteric fold. Unlike in the female with the uterus, where it's separated by the broad ligaments, the broad ligaments of the uterus. So I said in the male, you have a gentle peritoneal fold or ridge, that what we call the ureteric fold, which is formed as the peritoneum passes up and over the ureter and ductus deferens, as the vas deferens on each side of the posterior part of the bladder. So the ureteric fold separates the paravasical and pararectal fossae. So you see that it is, um, uh, it is the male equivalent of the broad ligament. Posterior to the ureteric folds in the male and lateral to the central rectovesical pouch, you have the peritoneum descending far enough caudally to cover the superior ends or superior posterior surfaces of the seminal glands, the seminal vesicles and ampullae of the ductus deferens. So the male reproductive, except for these sites and uh, like the testes in, uh, around the tunica virginalis which is derived from peritoneum, the male reproductive organs are not in contact with the peritoneum like you have with the females per se. So except from these ones I have uh, mentioned. In both uh, male and female, the inferior third of the rectum is below the inferior limits of the peritoneum. So we say it's subperitoneal. The middle third of the rectum is covered with peritoneum, so only on the anterior surface. And the superior third is covered on both its anterior and lateral surfaces. The rectosigmoid junction near the pelvic brain is intral peritoneal. Right here is an illustration of a transverse section of the peritoneum um, of the pelvis. It's a transverse section, so you can appreciate the, take a good look at the diagram. You can see the pareta peritoneum, the viscera peritoneum, close to the organ, and then the peritoneal cavity. You can also appreciate the mesentery there. So all what I've been explaining, you can appreciate at the, a section, the transverse section that is shown right there. So don't forget the peritoneal reflections in the pelvis you have for the male. The peritoneum descends at um, the anterior abdominal wall, and there's a loose attachment which allows insertion of the, uh, the bladder as it fills up. In the female, it descends the anterior abdominal wall. You also have a loose attachment there that allows the bladder to expand as it fills up. Then the peritoneal reflections in the pelvis is such that in the male, it reflects onto the superior surface of the bladder, creating the supravesical fossa. In the female, it also reflects onto the superior surface of the bladder, creating the supervisor supravesical fossa. Right here you have a sagittal, an illustration of the sagittal section of the peritoneal cavity. A close, that is actually that of a female 
so it will help you to ex um, appreciate what I have said so far regarding the peritoneal reflections and um, uh, the pouches, recto uterine pouch and the recto uh, recto uterine and the vesicle uterine pouch. You'll be able to appreciate all that from the diagram. So still looking at peritoneal reflections in the pelvis of both male and female, you have it covering the convex superior surface, the roof of the bladder in the male. It slopes down sides of the roof to ascend lateral wall of pelvis, creating the parabasical fossa on each side. In the female, the peritoneal reflection is such that it covers the convex superior surface, the roof of the bladder as well. It slopes down sides of the roof to ascend the lateral walls of the pelvis, creating the parabasical fossa on each side. Then the Peritoneal reflection in the male descends the posterior surface of the bladder as much as 2 cm. What about the female? It reflects from the bladder roof onto the body of the uterus, forming the vesica uterine pouch. The peritoneal reflection in the pelvis of the male reflects laterally, forms folds over the ureter's ureteric fold, also reflects onto the ductus deferens and the superior ends of the seminal vesicles. In the seminal glands, in the female, it covers the body and fundus of the uterus and posterior phonics of the vagina. It extends laterally from the uterus as double fold or mesentery, what we call the, the broad ligament that engulfs the uterine tubes, the ovaries and round ligaments of the uterus. Then the peritoneal reflection of the male pelvis reflects from the bladder and seminal glands onto the rectum and uh, it forms the rectal vasical pouch. In the female, it reflects from bladder onto the rectum, forming rectal uterine pouch. The peritoneal reflection in the male pelvis is such that you have the rectal vasical pouch extending laterally and posteriorly to form pararectal fossae on each side of the rectum. In the female, you have rectal uterine pouch extending laterally and posteriorly to form pararectal fossae on each side of the rectum. The, uh, you have uh, the peritoneum in the male, in the male pelvis ascending the rectum from inferior to superior. You have the rectum is being subperitoneal and then retroperitoneal, and the superior aspect is retroperitoneal. Then in the female, the peritoneum also ascends the rectum from inferior to superior. The, the inferior part of the rectum of the, of the female is subperitoneal and then the superior part is rectal peritoneal. The peritoneal, peritoneal reflection in the female male is such that it engulfs the sigmoid colon at the uh, beginning at the rectal sigmoid junction. In the female, it also engulfs the sigmoid colon beginning at the rectal sigmoid junction. I have said so much in this uh, lecture. I really appreciate your listening time. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Goodbye for now.